Hi, I'm Finian. And I'm Reva. And we are from the Santa Barbara Middle School Teen Press, and today we have the honor of interviewing Rodrigo Medellin and Anand Varma. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you too. Um, so our first question for you today is, when did you first discover your passion for photography? Uh, I would say at the end of high school is where I first started thinking about a camera as a way of documenting my adventures. Thank you. Um, so trace for us a brief roadmap of the passions, interests, concerns that led you to the work that you are presenting today. Okay, a very short story. <laughs> I, um, I started at a very early age, then I appeared on national TV in a contest in Mexico where I chose the topic of mammals to be asked questions. I appeared there and then the University of Mexico people who work on mammals called me and they said, why don't you come over and keep learning about mammals? I never looked back. Mm -hmm. What interests you so much about mammals? I, I think I have a little bit of a misconstruction in my brain so that my first word was not mama or dad or doodle. It was flamingo, which is not a mammal, but it's an animal, <laughs> right? And from then on, I just kept going wherever there was animals. I was right there. I was right there. I was right there. Did you have a lot of pets growing up? Yes, <laughs> including bats. Oh, wow. <laughs> including vampire bats living in the family bathroom. Whoa. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Many of your photos are focused around bugs. Uh, what about these creatures interest you? I like showing things that you can't see with your naked eyes. Mm -hmm. So there's something about bugs that are they're easy to find, they're easy to catch, they're easy to observe. But when you take a photograph of them, you get to show people the real beauty and complexity of these creatures that, you know, maybe they didn't notice when they walk by and they see them on a leaf somewhere. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you've traveled all over the world. How has your travels influenced you as a photographer? Well, Travel gives you a way to see a lot more than what's available in your backyard. So it's a way to see how much you have in common with everyone else in the world, and you can see what is also different and what you maybe didn't notice by staying at home. Is there one particular place that you've traveled to that really stood out to you or just was your favorite? Well, different places have been exciting for different reasons. Um, I would say one of the most memorable places was French Polynesia and getting to see the diversity in the ocean that appears at night and see all the little creatures that come out of the, the cracks and crevices uh, at night was, was left an impression because there were so many surprising things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. As part of a National Geographic Live, you have embraced the role of scientist as storyteller. Can you tell us about the word scientist and what it means to you? The word scientist is unfortunately very daunting for many people, and I'm uh, bent on changing that. We need a scientist to come down from that ivory tower. So the idea of a scientist is nothing more than a child at heart, keeping curiosity up, keeping it, uh, trying to learn about the world up as for as long as possible. So, uh, Charles Darwin is one of your heroes. Uh, what about him inspires you? The thing that, th the reason I have so much respect for Charles Darwin is he was able to observe the natural world and understand patterns about how the world develops, how the world is organized, that has helped everyone since him better understand the world around them. So, being able to identify these patterns and processes has helped so many more people uh, explain how the world works. And so that is something, that is a kind of contribution that I inspire to in my life as well. In an interview about renewable energy, you talked about changing the uh, speed of wind turbine, turbines to um, six meters per second. How will that higher speed uh, help bat populations? Okay, so the way it is right now, the wind turbines come from a factory setting in which they kick in at three meters per second. Three meters per second, you have a lot of bugs up there flying and therefore a lot of bats feeding on those bugs. If you increase that kick in 
speed to six meters per second only, which is a breeze. There's no insects up there and therefore no bats there. So you're saving about 70% to 80% of the mortality by just changing that setting. And at the same time, between three meters and six meters per second, the turbine, any particular turbine, is not producing about 1% of the energy that they would produce otherwise. So it's only 1% for 70% of the bats. Do their research. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we also heard you talk about the complexity of life and how um, it deserves to be enjoyed. Can you tell us about an experience in nature where you were able to enjoy the complexity of life in all living things? I mean, I think one of the projects I'm going to be talking about today on stage is the story of parasites that are controlling and manipulating their hosts. And I think that's those examples are some of the most complex interactions that I've come across in my research and in my observations of nature. And so to learn about how these creatures that we think of as very simple, you know, a worm, a bug, a cricket, you don't, we don't think of these as the most sophisticated animals or the, the most sophisticated forms of life on our planet. But to realize that something that we think of as so simple is able to do something so complex to me, that teaches us about how much we have left to learn about the planet. And that's, those have been some of the most exciting lessons that I've learned in the course of my work. Thank you. Um, so this is a question for both of you. Uh, what do you hope people get out of your presentation today? I, ultimately, my highest goal is for people to see the world in a new way, for them to to leave today and think about honeybees and think about hummingbirds and insects and realize, you know what, there is more to these creatures than what I assumed in the past. And if there's more to these creatures, maybe there's more to ferns and crabs and dolphins and seagulls and flatworms and everything else because there's so much that we have left to understand about our planet. And if I can open their eyes in this few examples that I've specialized on, maybe that will inspire them to be curious about everything else as well. Do you have anything to add on that? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> this, is, uh, th th this is an amazing opportunity to advance a goal that Anna and I have been working on and discussing and enjoying for the past two years, three years, which is how curiosity of the mu human mind with technology with talent for photography can really help expand the knowledge and grow links to the natural world in the, any population anywhere in the world. If curiosity and technology and the images come together, my God, you have it. And if you guys could give us one homework assignment, what would it be? Find something in your backyard that you have taken for granted, that you've seen a hundred times, and try to find something new about that creature, that plant, that animal, and, and try to see if there's something you never noticed before. Very cool. Number one, never ever lose your passion. For whatever drives you, never lose your passion. And number two, there will be doors that are going to be shut in front of you. There will be setbacks. Never, ever give up. That's the two assignments. Thank you guys so much for speaking with us today. Pleasure. Thank you. I can't wait to see your guys' presentation. We're looking forward to it. Let's see. Hope you like it. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you.